Welcome to lecture 17, where we will be talking about atmosphere and severe weather. Um, yes, sometimes it's harder to predict than cats. All right, so let's have a review of air pressure. So remember, air pressure at sea level is about 14.7 psi, or one kilogram per centimeter squared. Uh, air pressure decreases with rising altitude, and our units of measurement are millibars. So sea level is 1,013.2 uh, millibars. And then we have inches of mercury, which is known as standard, where we have 29.92 inches of mercury. Um, instruments used to measure air pressure are a barometer. So you have the mercury and the aneroid barometer. One has liquid, one does not. Um, and then we have the barograph, which is the continuous recording of air pressure. So here is our mercury barometer, and here is our barograph. Okay, so wind is moving air that exerts force and has a certain magnitude and direction. Uh, direction is generally horizontal because uh, of advection, which is energy transfer, but it will move from areas of high pressure to low pressure um, naturally, which forms basically a uh, troughs and well really high points so it makes like hills and valleys essentially um so the pressure gradient force is the movement of air from high pressure to low pressure and these are measured in isobars and gradients uh, so this is most important and most productive in making winds okay is the pressure gradient force that's that movement from high to low pressure okay the other one is the coriolis effect which if you're not familiar with that, the earth spins. And as the earth spins, it actually deflects wind based on which hemisphere you're in depends on the direction. So in the Northern hemisphere, wind will deflect to the right like this. In the Southern hemisphere, it will deflect to the left. And this has a lot of impacts in things like tornadoes, uh, hurricanes, and cyclone formation. It's also the reason why in the southern hemisphere the water spins down counterclockwise, but in the northern hemisphere it spins down clockwise. It's all because of this. It's pretty neat. Then we have friction. Uh, so friction isn't as big. So pressure gradient force, biggest one. Coriolis deflect is a deflection that's due to the spinning of the earth. Um, and so low pressure zones when spiral inwards and high pressure zones will spiral outwards because of this uh, so friction though friction is only important near the surface of the earth um, and it acts to slow air movement and alters its direction by like 30 to 45 degrees and this is only something that happens as wind gets close to the surface because it's friction that slows it down Okay, uh, so how do we mark wind? We use isobars, as can be seen on the map here. So these are isobars. They're the same thing as the thermal ones that we have, except they're for wind. It's different from isotherms because it's not temperature at each line. With isobars, we put the millibar number um, and use wind speed symbols to represent miles per hour. So it, remember how I said Coriolis effect, Earth rotates, changing the direction of the wind. So in the northern hemisphere, we deflect to the right. In the southern hemisphere, we will actually deflect to the left. This is part of why planes, even though they're going technically in a straight line, need to move at a curve, and it's because of the Coriolis effect. Um, so friction, again, only important near the surface. So when we're up high, there is no friction. But when we're near the land, there is friction, so it will cause wind to deflect by 30 to 45 degrees. Okay, um, so remember, wind moves from areas of high pressure to low pressure, making ridges and troughs, okay? Or troughs, sorry. Um, so we're going to have upper air winds, which will blow parallel to isobars, uh, which are known as geostrophic winds. And then we have the jet stream, which is kind of like um, ocean currents, but for the air. These are rivers of air at high altitude and velocity. They tend to go around 120 to 240 uh, kilometers per hour. It's supposed to be an M, not a P. Uh, 
Okay. Um, so it almost creates a wave. Uh, the jet stream is very important to us. It's part of how um, a lot of weather gets moved around, how a lot of air gets moved around, going from upper to lower, uh, circulation-wise. Uh, it's also really important for birds. Birds will fly in the jet stream because it's easier for them, for example. Uh, we also like to fly in the jet stream. Um, all right, so pressure versus high, low pressure versus high pressure. Um, cyclones are the life cycle of a low pressure system, right here. Okay, and as we can see, we are swirling inwards. Okay, um, cyclones don't mean a tornado. Okay, I know we use it to say tornado, but when we're talking about a low pressure system or a mid latitude cyclone, we're talking about a low pressure zone. Okay. Um, they form around thunderstorms. They form because of tornadoes. They form because of hurricanes. Okay. Um, they form because two air masses come into contact, both warm and cold. Um, remember, warm air tends to be higher and colder kind of wedges itself underneath. So if they combine, they form a low pressure system. Um, and because it's a low pressure system, it's going to cause spinning. But once it's done, it will start to go backwards. So instead of going in, it's going to go out, which is forming a high pressure zone, also known as an anticyclone. Okay, but we're going to get to that in a sec. Cyclones spin differently because of the Coriolis effect in the northern and summer, southern hemisphere. So in the northern hemisphere, we have clockwise or counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, we have clockwise. Okay. Very important. And this is known as convergence because we have air moving inward. Anticyclones are centers of high pressure. Winds start to move outwards, known as divergence. How this works is your cold air is dense, wanting to sink, but your warm air wants to rise. Uh, so the, due to the Coriolis effect, we get spinning. Both turn, both form a spin of some sort of velo velocity uh, or vorticity, which is vortexing. Um, and the air is spun at an angle, which promotes lifting, uh, which forms clouds when we have the low pressure system to lift and mixing, no, which causes a frontal zone. Uh, so this vertical spinning means that there's less dense air that occurs, and therefore the pressure lowers. So air continues to go up the middle. So when we have our low pressure zone, air will go up the middle, clouds will form and you'll get precipitation of some sort. Depending on the type of cyclone, depends on if you get thunderstorms, if you get tornadoes, if you get hurricanes, whatever. Clouds form, you get a sharp temperature change. Um, and so usually with a storm involved, it's a cold front. And if it's just a warm front, then it's just like some kind of rain and a little bit of storms, but not as violent as a cold front. Uh, so the air that gets pushed away is then taken away by the jet stream and off it goes. Um, it's so basically, it's like the exhaust pipe. So before it reaches this point, a cyclone can die. A cyclone can die out at this point. This is very easy. Uh, if it does occur at a good rate where you have air moving up and you have air moving away at a good rate, it can become mature. So it, it's when it's most intense. And this is when you're going to have strong storms. But as the air becomes drier, this is worked into the low pressure system, which breaks up the water or the, the precipitation. Um, and this allows it to start to unwind. So while it's going this way, now it's gonna go the opposite direction. Now it's gonna move out, it's gonna move out, it's gonna move out, it's gonna move out rather than moving in. And that's where we get our anticyclone. Most of the central US is a low pressure system with the upper Northwest being a high, into Canada being primarily high pressure systems, which is neat. Cyclones form from various ways. So we're going to go over this in the next couple slides. There's five stages. So the first one is a stationary front, which is the development of a frontal zone. Uh, so because high pressure air wants to flow out from the center, um, cold air masses equal dense and higher pressure. Warm air masses equal less dense and lower pressure. Okay, both are going to head right for that air mass. But instead of a head-on collision, they're going to be slightly off from each other due to the Earth's spin. So our cold front is going to come in and our warm front is going to come in and it's going to do that rather than some sort of head-on collision. 
which is going to lead to us having a spin starting to occur where we get this. Okay, and this is how our vortex begins, our vorticity. Um, so this causes the spin that we see, um, and due to the spin, they are at an angle, which causes lifting. And so this basically leads to this lifting that's occurring. Um, and so the formation of clouds occurs because of lifting. And so as we lift, we get colder, which drops the dew point so that we're going to have the condensation of clouds and we're going to have precipitation. Part two is the cyclone system. Uh, so the air will turn inward during a low pressure system. Why? Because airflow goes from high to low pressure, which balances things out. So as air tries to move up, it gets spun around, causing it to move up through the middle. And this is where we're going to get our pressure gradient. So because the spin is not increasing in pressure, but going up uh, mid pressure into the atmosphere, you're going to have a decrease in pressure, uh, a decrease in temperature, which is going to lead to cloud formation. So clouds form on warm and cold fronts. Clouds bring precipitation with warm fronts and storms and rains with cold fronts. So if we have a warm front going on, we're just going to have some rain. It might be a lot of rain, but it's rain. But if we happen to have a cold front, we're not just going to get rain. It's going to get a little bit more violent than rain. We're going to get thunderstorms, uh, possibly tornadoes. Okay, other things can occur. So at this point, it can either intensify and mature, or it could just die out. So if it does start to intensify, uh, the cyclone will need an exhaust pump. Okay, so remember we have this air moving up okay, and out. And so if we have the exhaust pipe working, which is our jet stream, jet stream will take that away and move it off. Um, this is how we get what we know as the comma head, which is this shape in the storm. As the comma head is drawn out, there is a dry slot in here where there is no clouds. This is made up of colder, drier air, and it works in and around the low pressure system. So the system occludes, the dry spot breaks up into parts, um, and this is where we're gonna start to hit the end, because after a few days, the momentum will slow down, especially as of after excessive amounts of precipitation occur, because once you get rid of all that moisture, you're gonna be dry, okay? And once it's dry, there's nothing really moving it anymore. Uh, so it will start to die and it will begin to unwind. Uh, so convergence and divergence. Convergence is air going into the low pressure system. Divergence is air moving away, moving out. Um, so air converges into a cyclone and is pushed up the middle in the atmosphere and then it gets taken away, all right? Uh, so in a low pressure system, it goes from the bottom to the top. In a high pressure system, Air still moves through, but it's still from up to down. Sucking air versus pushing air. So, cyclones. This is the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And we can see how we have counterclockwise versus clockwise. Cool, right? So here's where we're seeing a low pressure system where we have air moving in. And this is the comma head right here that we were mentioning before. So remember, convergence is a high pressure, divergence, is low pressure. One is going to push air up. The other one is going to suck air down. So the warmer air near the surface is going to naturally go up into the atmosphere where it will cool and sink. So we're going to have this constant flow of air. This is what causes global wind. Um, so this rising of air cooling and dropping is known as the fountain effect, um, and it forms the circulation of the earth. So the ITZ, ITCZ, which is the inner tropical convergence zone, you don't need to know that. You're good with just this. ITCZ. Um, the semi-permanent high pressure zone and the trade winds of the northeast and southeast all form because of this fountain effect. So, fun fact. The semi-permanent semi -permanent high pressure zone that's in and the uh, ITCZ is part of why the Bermuda Triangle exists. So the semi-permanent high pressure zone actually occurs over Bermuda. So this is why we have that triangle where it gets really still, but we also have gases bubbling up from below, and that's why it causes buoyancy to change. Yeah. So that's why things sink, and it causes air pressure to change, and that's why planes will crash there. It's super cool. Anyway, uh, air traveling to the equator from the tropics, or the subtropical area, creates our trade winds. So here's our subtropical area. Here's our trade winds. Okay, remember, they're deflected. 
due to the Coriolis effect. These bring dry air down towards the equatorial line, which is where we have a natural low pressure system. Okay, subtropical high is a natural high pressure system. Equatorial low is a natural low pressure system. So this brings warm, dry air there, and it's great for sailors because it's these nice, strong westerly winds, uh, easterly and westerly, whatever. There are these nice, strong winds, and they're great for sailors, um, especially when you're actually in a sailboat. Um, air traveling from the poles or to the poles from the subtropical area is known as the westerlies. Okay, so they deflect to the right because of the Coriolis effect. So these bring warm, humid air up. Um, so our trade winds equals dry, warm air. Our westerlies equals humid, warm air. So the tripartite circulation of the Earth is in the image here to the left. If you look in terms of pressure, it would be high up here at the North Pole. It's high over here in the subtropic, low at the equator, and ha, um, and uh, low in the Arctic zone, so about here, it gets to a low pressure area. So it goes high, low, high, low, and it makes bands. The polar easterlies will bring cold, dry air south. Um, so as the seasons change, so do the winds. Uh, so depending on what time of year, you'll get different current, uh, different uh, winds going on. So in the winter, we're going to get the polar easter easterlies, which is where we're going to get our cold dry air packets coming from the north. Whereas in the summer, we're gonna have our westerlies really kicking in and the northeast trade winds where we're gonna get that hot, uh, humid, warm, humid air coming up and dry, warm air going down. Winds will affect the weather because you're moving around warm, humid air, for example. That's gonna cause a lot of rain. Whereas if you bring down a lot of cold, dry air, you're just gonna get very cool conditions, no rain. So this has to do with the influence of continents. So seasonal temperature differences disrupt the global uh, pressure patterns and wind patterns, um, and it's greatest in the northern hemisphere. Okay, uh, this is how we get things like monsoon season. Uh, so seasonal change in wind direction occurring over land in the warm months causes air to flow onto land from the ocean. Okay, so ocean is going to give us moist air, and it's going to give us warm air. So when wet warm air starts rising, it is going to cool, where it's going to form clouds, and then precipitation, okay? Whereas in the winter, air is going to flow off the land, so we're going to get cool, dry air, okay? And so you're going to get less rain, and you're going to get your cooler weather. So the westerlies are a complex pattern where airflow is interrupted by cyclones, okay? Cells move from west to east in the northern hemisphere and east to west in the southern hemisphere. Um, and they are created by anticyclonic and cyclonic flows of air. Uh, the paths of these are associated with upper level airflow. Uh, so local winds are produced with temperature differences. Okay, So example, land breezes, sea breezes, mountains, and valley breezes, Chinook and Santa Ana winds. These all have to do with regional temperature differences. Remember we were talking about albedo earlier, where how, how much something reflects? Okay, so the ocean warms slower than the land because water has a higher albedo than land does. But just because it has a lower albedo doesn't mean it has the same heat capacity. Remember sand, it'll get really hot during the day because it absorbs, but at night it releases it very quickly. Okay, air warms. It does what? It rises, and as it rises, new air needs to come in to replace it. And as it rises, it's going to cool, so it will sink back down. So it makes the convective cycle, right? Um, so when it comes to land and sea breezes, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, being that we live, I don't know, in Florida, near the coast, uh, remember, hot air will rise, and it will cool, and it will sink, okay? Convection. Especially in Florida because this happens on both sides of Florida, because we are a peninsula. But this happens along all of the coastline, these land and sea breezes. And they're usually very nice. People like them. Um, so because of convection, we get these interesting patterns happening. So during the day, we get sea breezes. Okay. Uh, so what happens is, because of our low albedo, the land heats up faster, which causes air to rise, air to rise where it will cool off and it will sink. And then it gets its 
drags onto land because that hot air rising creates a vacuum. And this is what causes our sea breeze, which is our cooler breeze. However, if you've ever been on the beach during the day and then at night, you'll notice that the wind changes from coming this way to going this way. Okay, and that's because at night, our land has a low heat capacity, so it, it gives up its heat much faster, whereas the water stays pretty warm. So it will start rising here because it's still warmer, where it will travel, and as it cools, it drops here. Um, and so overall, it causes wind going outwards towards sea, which is cooler. So during the day, it is a sea breeze, and at night, it is a land breeze. Okay, and we have a very similar thing happening with mountains and valleys. Mountain slopes are usually heated much faster than a valley. Uh, so what will happen is the air on the slope of the valley going up into the mountains will rise, which causes a lack of air here, which causes cold air to just pull, be pulled right down. Um, whereas during the evening, the warm air from the valley that has been created throughout the day will start to rise, which then sucks cool air down the mountain, creating a mountain breeze. So daytime, valley breeze. Nighttime, mountain breeze. Both are nice. And then we have the Chinook and Santa Ana. So Chinooks are warm, dry winds moving down the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains. Okay, so they do this. We're going to pretend these are the Rockies. Um, I know it's not, but we're going to pretend really hard. Um, so how Chinooks work is we have our mountain range. Okay, here's the Rocky Mountains. Uh, so Chinooks, uh, we have winds moving down warm and dry, the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains. Okay, so remember, moist warm air goes up, we have rain, and then on the other side, we have warm dry air that comes down. Okay, Santa Ana's are very similar. The difference is their location. So Chinooks happen by the Rockies, Santa Ana's happen in Southern California. And they come, you have this cool dry air instead of warm dry air coming out towards the ocean. Uh, so it's kind of like a land breeze, okay? And it's essentially um, air that just comes this way versus air that goes this way. So one goes east, the other comes west. One's along the Rocky Mountains, one's along Southern California. Okay, so remember, cool, dry air, Southern California, Santa Ana. Warm, dry air, Rocky Mountains. So we've been talking a lot about wind, um, and I've been mentioning that we use different ways to uh, show wind speed and direction, right? Uh, but we have to measure it somehow, correct? Um, and how do we do that? Well, we do that with uh, wind vanes, which move in 360 degrees. I hope you all like this one. It's Godzilla. Um, and then for speed, we use something called an anemometer. So if, if it's easier to remember, a nemo meter, a nemo meter. And that is how I remember it because that's how I remember to spell it. A nemo meter. It's actually an anemometer, but a nemo meter works. Okay. Um, and with the anemometer, we measure in miles per hour or knots. And this is an anemometer. Um, there are this type of anemometer, and then there's the type that is electric. Both are nice. This is a little harder to do because you have to figure out how to count how many times that little red cup goes around. Electric ones are much easier to use. You just basically hold them up and the fan goes and it counts. So, wind. Wind is labeled based on where it originates from, not where it's going, where it originates from. Okay, so if we have wind coming from the northeast. That means it's coming from the northeast. It's a northeasterly wind. Um, it, it may be going southwest, but we're not going to say it's a southwestern wind. We're going to say where it originates from, which is the northeast. Um, a prevailing wind is a wind that comes from uh, one direction more than any other. Okay, so if you have a prevailing northerly wind, that means we have a wind coming from the north more often than any other direction. Changes in wind direction generally is associated with the locations of cyclones and anticyclones. And these changes often bring temperature changes and moisture condition changes. Uh, so this has to do with our global distribution of precipitation. 
So high pressure areas are generally going to have dry conditions because high pressure, you're not going to have clouds. Whereas low pressure areas are going to have lots of precipitation. Remember we were talking about this earlier about who gets more rain throughout the year. And I'm sure we've all heard that places like um, Bermuda don't get a lot of rain. And that's because they're in the tropical region versus the subtropical region. Okay. Um, so the equi equatorial zone has a lot of rain. Okay, that's because it is always a low pressure zone. So you have a lot of rain going on in here. Whereas our subtropical area, like the Tropic of Cancer, um, the Tropic of Capricorn, they're going to be high pressure zones. So you're going to have less rain there. We don't get a lot of precipitation up at the northern and southern poles because they are zones of high pressure. Um, we also don't get a lot in here because this part of the United States is almost always high pressure, whereas this zone of the United States is almost always a low pressure system. And you can see that. Um, we also don't have a lot in certain areas because of mountain ranges along other areas which trap moisture because of the rain shadow effect. Subtropical deserts are also desert-like because of a subtropical high. Okay, this is our high pressure system along the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. Um, we also have the nature of air. What's its moisture capacity or relative humidity? Latitude is also very important, as well as the distribution of continents and mountains. Remember I said mountains on there and the ocean. So, and this is where we see things like the currents making a difference. Remember, depending on the currents, depends on how much uh, heat you have. So, for example, we have a current going this way down California, which is why it's drier over here, versus a current going this way, which is going to bring warm humid. So this brings us to air masses, which are internally homogeneous masses of air horizontally. Okay, so they're horizontal, not vertical, horizontal air masses with regards to its meteorological composition uh, characteristics, which is wind, temperature, dew point, and visibility. Basically, it's the same throughout the air mass, which is what homogeneous means. Um, and it's changed due to wind, temperature, and dew point, and visibility within. So it's not affected by pressure. When temperature changes, pressure changes. Pressure doesn't change, and then temperature changes. It's always the other way around, um, especially when it comes to air masses. So air masses develop in a source region, which is when air in a certain location is stagnant or remains still for a long period of time, so that through energy exchange, like radiation, it will acquire the basic characteristics of the region or location it is in. Um, and this is all based on latitude and longitude. So latitude determines if the air mass is considered polar or cold or tropical warm. And longitude determines if it forms over land, which will make it dry, which is continental, or over the sea, which makes it humid, and we call it maritime. Okay, And we get all these little symbols from it. And all these symbols are very important. Polar, Arctic, tropical continental maritime right some of them are capital and some of them are lowercase and that's on purpose and this leads to four types of air masses because of these source regions right so we have continental polar continental is lowercase polar is uppercase continental tropical continental tropical maritime polar little m big p maritime tropical little m big t okay so remember that little gives us the difference between humid and dry, and those bigs give us the difference between cold and warm. So continental polar, dry and cold. Continental tropical, dry and warm. Maritime polar, humid and cold. Maritime tropical, humid and warm. Humid and cold is the worst, by the way. There is nothing worse than being cold and wet. Temperature is not a factor here because it is visible throughout, variable throughout the year. Temperature always can change. Air mass sources tend to exclude most of the United States because energy transfer is greatest in the mid-latitude areas. Um, so this means that you're going to get stuff generally forming in Canada and um, over in the tropical areas. Um, so what if an air mass stays where it moves to? So it moves from upper Canada, making it a continental polar, so a dry and cold landmass, and it just kind of stays still in, let's say, Florida. Well, if it just stays still in Florida, it will eventually warm up and become humid because we have a lot of water around us. 
And that's, that's what happens. Then it'll move on and bring that humidity somewhere else. So continental polar and maritime tropical air masses are very important in North America. Um, east of the Rockies, we have a lot of continental polar from northern Canada and Alaska. Oh, by the way, there is a fifth. There is a fifth. It's called continental Arctic. Continental Arctic comes from the North Pole. And uh, we're not really learning about it because it's not going to affect us. But this is our dry, really cold air. And this is, tends to affect Canada. It can make it all the way down to Florida if it prevails enough and doesn't stay still. But this is what the Canadians expect during winter is this continental Arctic wind. Fun fact. Anyway, so in winter, our continental polar will bring cold, dry air. But in the summer, it's a nice, cool breeze. Um, this is part of the reason for lake effect snow. We have Lake Superior here, which is one of the Great Lakes. Um, it is around uh, New York and Ohio. And then we have Lake, Sup uh, lake Michigan and Michigan. Uh, this happens on both of them. And what we can see happening here is because the lake tends to be warmer uh, than the surrounding air, this cold, dry air mass, it will actually pick up humidity freeze it, and you get all this snow just coming off the lake. Uh, so areas living near these great lakes will tend to get foot up after foot after foot of snow. So Michigan can get like 20 to 30 feet of snow per year. Uh, in the upper peninsula of Michigan, their houses have two doors, one on each floor. Um, and I asked about that when I was up there. And the reason for that is so when they get so much snow that they can't get out their front door, they can pop on snowshoes and walk out the top door and kind of dig their way down, which is pretty cool and scary. Um, so source regions for air masses. So for maritime tropical, or our maritime tropical, we're going to get the Gulf of Mexico, the Atlantic Ocean, and we're going to have warm, moist, unstable air. So we're gonna get a lot of rain. Uh, continental tropical uh, comes from the Southwest and Mexico. It's hot and dry, so we're not gonna have precipitation. Maritime polar uh, originates in the oceans of the north. So we're gonna have precipitation in the Western mountains. Um, this will occasionally cause a nor'easter for us northerners. Um, and then we have continental polar. Uh, these originate over the land in the north, bringing dry, cold air south. It is these continental polar uh, air masses that will make it down to Florida and give us our cold snap. So a front is a boundary that separates air masses into different densities. Uh, the air mass itself will retain what it is, so it's either maritime polar or continental tropical. However, the warmer, less dense air is forced up, and the cooler air acts like a wedge, pushing it up, okay? Um, the frontal zone is the area where the interaction occurs between the masses, and there are four types. So we have a warm front, cold front, stationary, and a fluted front. So the warm front is made up of warm air, which is replaced with cooler air. Um, on a weather map, it is represented by this, a line with red half circles. Um, clouds become lower as the front nears. It will have a very slow rate of advance. Um, and it has light to moderate precipitation, but it's not going to have any like heavy storms or um, it's basically it'll rain all day. That's a, that's a warm front. Whereas a cold front, a cold front is naturally cold air. Um, it will replace warm air um, and it's shown on the weather map as a blue line and blue triangles. Uh, so for both of these, both the warm front and the cold front, this thing points in the direction the front is going. It advances faster than a warm front and is associated with violent weather, a okay? high amount of precipitation for short periods. So when we get a violent thunderstorm, it'll last like 20 minutes and it's done, it's gone, maybe even less. That's from a cold front. And you'll notice this because we'll have a temperature drop right before rain starts, which is interesting. So if you've ever been outside and you felt the temperature just plummet and then all of a sudden we have a lot of high wind, we have a thunderstorm happening, that's a cold front. And you can actually see them move in because it looks like a wedge of clouds, it's super neat. Um, so the weather behind a cold front is dominated by cold air mass. 
subsiding air and clear conditions. So when we have one of these, for the rest of the day, it'll tend to stay a little bit cooler and you'll have no clouds. So what makes a cold front faster than a warm front is actually the angle of the air. The cold front is 1 to 100, so it's a bigger angle, whereas the warm front is more like a like this. It's a lot slower. So what we can see here, warm front right here, here's our our red bump half circles. Okay, again, we can see that it's moving in the direction the front is moving, and we have it approaching a cold front, or a cold front is approaching it, which causes the warm air to rise, and then we will have rain. Again, we have a cold front coming in, it is represented by these triangles, again pointing in the direction. It is a wedge, so it will push the air up, forming cumulonimbus clouds and violent storms, versus some nice moderate storms and afterwards you'll have some clouds in the sky and nice and warm temperatures. A stationary front has air flowing on both sides of the front. Um, it's almost parallel to that front line and the position doesn't move. And so this is when we have a warm front bordered by a cold front and then another cold front moving in. Um, and this causes air to go up in two directions at once. So it'll stay still and you'll essentially have on one side very violent storms and on the other side just moderate precipitation. And it will not move. For this, you will have a symbol that looks like this. Meaning the warm front is going this way and the cold front is going this way. So they're kind of stuck. Nothing's moving. They're staying in one spot and it's just causing a lot of rain. An occluded front is when a cold front overtakes a warm front, like here. Okay. Um, the cold air wedges the warm air up and it leads to some really complex weather. Precipitation is associated with warm air being forced up. So you'll have a lot of really weird stuff happening. This is where we're going to see our cyclones forming. And it's represented like this. So mid-latitude cyclones are primarily the weather producer of the middle latitude. Ideally, they move east across the U.S. Um, and you can see their approach in the western sky, almost like Gandalf coming to save everyone at Helm's Deep, but instead of from the east, it's from the west. It will take two to four days to pass a region. And the largest weather contrast due to this is the spring and changes in weather associated with a mid-latitude cyclone depending on the path of the storm. Uh, so in the north, in the spring, you're going to get a lot of weird stuff happening. Um, in March, we say in like a lion, out like a lamb. And that's because in March, you have a lot of weird stuff happening. You could have a freak blizzard. You could have a thunderstorm. It can get really warm. It can get really cold. But the idea is by April, things should have calmed down. All right, so again, cold front, see the direction it's moving. Warm front, see the direction it's moving. Here is our stationary front, and then here is our occluded front. Warm fronts, you're going to have lower, thicker clouds, light to moderate precipitation, but here's the, here's the important one. After it passes, after it passes, winds become southerly or warmer. You're going to have an increase in temperature, and you will have some fluffy clouds. Whereas a cold front is a much more ominous wall of dark clouds and heavy precipitation. You're going to have things like hail, occasional tornadoes occur with these fronts. After it has passed, you will have northerly or chilly winds. Skies will become very clear and temperatures will remain low. Um, so instead of having those nice fluffy clouds, you will have an entirely clear sky with maybe some cirrus clouds. So again, we're going to look at the cyclonic flow because this is where you're going to see these things happening. So with the low pressure system, we have a cold front meeting a warm front, which will make an occluded front, which is essentially what makes the cyclone. All right, thunderstorms. Features of thunderstorms are cumulonimbus clouds, which are very, very tall clouds. Um, you will have heavy rain, you will have lightning. Sometimes you even have hail, which is really cool. Um, there are about 2,000 thunderstorms that are in progress at any given time, and we have about 100,000 per year in the US. Most frequently, they are in Florida, in the Eastern Gulf Coast region, and our area of Florida, Tampa, thanks to the Selman Expressway, is the lightning capital. How does it develop? It requires warm, moist air. Instability, or lifting, uh, which is due to high surface temperature, making them more common in the afternoon and early morning. So stages of development. 
So you need a constant supply of warm, moist air. Constant. Constant. Without that, it dies. Each surge causes air to rise higher, resulting in updraft and downdraft. And this is how we get hail. Um, the cooling effect of precipitation marks the end of the thunderstorm's activity. So if it starts out with really hot rain, it's going to keep going. As that rain becomes colder and colder, you're going to the end of it. So during the cumulus stage, you're going to have updraft of warm air. This causes it to grow. And then we will have downdraft of this cooler air, which is going to cause the precipitation to condense, causing heavy rain and thunder and lightning. Okay, this is the mature stage. Um, so your updraft and downdraft are going to exist side by side. Uh, but when updrafts uh, cease, and it becomes primarily downdraft, it's going to result in just some light rain, and that will be the end of activity. So now we're going to get into some severe weather, which I know you're all excited about. Tornadoes and typhoons and hurricanes. Oh my! Tornadoes! Tornadoes are cool and dangerous, but they're cool. Um, other names for tornadoes are the twister, it's a twister, and cyclones. Uh, people don't actually get sent to Oz when they experience a was a, a tornado it it will kill you don't get caught in one it will it's not it's not pretty so a tornado is a localized storm with a short but devastating duration devastating duration um it features a rotating column that we're also familiar with um and air extends from cumulonimbus clouds to the surface so it makes a cone of cloud um inside the column you have low pressure. Winds will approach 480 kilometers per hour, which is 300 miles per hour. It's pretty fast. Within, this is the cool thing, within a really strong tornado, you can get tiny tornadoes, which are called vortices. Don't keep calm. It is a twister. Um, and yes, people don't act. <laughs> These are vortices. So here is our tornado center. This all out here is our tornado. But because it's so strong, we have these little tiny vortices inside, which kind of look like dust devils. So tornadoes are associated with severe thunderstorms. Out in the Midwest, they are very common, where we have these large, wide, flat plains. Um, they do have tornado alerts the same way we have hurricane alerts, except it's kind of immediate, where it's like, hey, we have a really bad thunderstorm coming in. BT dubs, be safe, keep an eye out, listen to the radio you may have a tornado in your region, okay? Best thing to do, this is why people up north have basements in the Midwest. People will go down into a root cellar, which is probably the safest place you can be. If you are out and about, you try to get to places like ditches along the side of the road. Those are the safest places to be when a, thunder when a uh, tornado hits, to be honest. So, like I said, they are associated with severe thunderstorms, um, it is the product of interaction between updraft and tropospheric winds. There are an average of 1,297 in the U.S. between 2000 and 2014, and they occur between April and June most frequently. Atmospheric conditions for formation are a cold front, supercell thunderstorms, also known as huge thunderstorms, cold, dry, continental, polar air masses will meet a warm, humid, maritime tropical because these are the greatest contrast so cp versus mt is the greatest contrast okay they are the most opposite so it results in these super intense storms which are known as supercell thunderstorms um, and this is why they end up occurring most in the midwest because you have those continental polar winds coming down and the maritime tropical coming up and they will cause a cyclone to form characteristics you can have a diameter of 150 to 600 meters, or 500 to 2,000 feet. Um, its speed of 45 kilometers an hour up to, remember that highest warrant, which was 300 miles per hour. Max winds are over 500 kilometers per hour. Um, they can cut a 10 kilometer long path. Um, and how do we measure them? We measure them with the Fujita Intensity Scale, which is known as the EF scale. So it is very, very hard to forecast tornadoes. Um, some factors may cause one tornado to form, but not other for tornadoes to form. Um, so tornado watches go into effect to alert the possibility 
of a tornado, and it's usually when conditions are considered favorable, like having a supercell thunderstorm. Tornado warnings are issued when a tornado is sighted or shown by radar. Okay, this is where Doppler radar comes into effect. It has helped increase accuracy by locating and detecting air motion. So hurricanes, which I'm sure you're all familiar with by this point, is characterized by intense convective activity and strong cyclonic circulation. They form between 5 and 20 degrees latitude. They tend to form off the coast of Africa in the Atlantic Ocean in our, on our side and in the West Pacific. Um, wind speeds can reach up to 300 kilometers per hour. Uh, they will generate 50-foot waves at sea. They're awful. Don't get caught at sea with a hurricane. It sucks. Um, different areas of the world have different names. In East Asia, they are called a typhoon. In the Indian Ocean, they call it a cyclone. And, of course, we call it hurricanes. The North Pacific has the greatest number of hurricanes per year. Um, parts of it include the eye wall, the eye, but the eye wall in particular has the most intense convective energy. It's basically a wall of cumulonimbus clouds, but it has the greatest wind speeds and rainfall. So it is the most dangerous part of the hurricane. They are the most violent storms on Earth. They are intense centers of low pressure forming over tropical oceans. Um, once wind speed is greater than 119 kilometers per hour or 74 miles per hour, um, it will have a rotary cyclonic circulation, meaning it will have developed an eye. Um, this will give it a name. This gives it uh, the naming ability. When a hurricane causes death, when there is direct death related to hurricanes, its name is actually retired. It will never be used again. Parts include the eye wall, which is near the center. It's where all the rising air occurs. It's where you're going to have the most intense convective activity. The eye is the very center. It's about 20 kilometers in diameter. Precipitation ceases here. You will have warm air, and it is very calm. It is the calmest part of the hurricane. You can look straight up and see the walls around you, and you will have clear skies in there with some clouds. Intense low pressure zone, just to review. Intense low pressure zone. Eye wall is right here. The eye is the calmest. This is where you're going to have a lot of up air going in and in the center you're going to have down pulled air it does spin like this in the northern hemispheres remember counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere interesting thing hurricanes do not pass the equator they can't um, for those of you who have heard this before in ecuador for example water just drains straight down it doesn't spin it just goes <laughs> um, and the reason for that is because there is no spin because it's the equator there is no Coriolis effect there. Um, so if something's spinning and passes a place where there is no spin, it dies. So hurricanes can't pass from south to north or north to south. The side that is hardest to be on, okay, this is the most dangerous, but the part that's the worst to be on is honestly right about here. Because here, is where you're going to get hit with wind and the storm surge. When you're being hit with this part, uh, water has already been dropped. You're mostly just getting wind and rain. Here you're getting storm surge, rain, and wind. Over here, which is our zone, as we can see, it forms off the coast of Africa due to heating water, causing energy, and that energy causes a twist because usually what happens is you have thunderstorms coming off of here. Um, and so we will have thunder, uh, hurricanes most prominently during August to October. Here, we're going to have June to October. Uh, in the Pacific Ocean, you're going to get June to December in this section. And over here, June to November. Um, and then over here, we have January to March and January to March. So yes, Australia also gets hurricanes. Isn't that lovely? Hurricanes form in tropical waters, except the South Atlantic and Eastern Pacific. So again, tropical waters, uh, they form in the late summer due to energy from condensing water vapor, as in evaporation. Um, hurricanes form due to the energy of evaporation over warm water. This is why hurricanes get stronger over water and weaken over land. Um, it is a cyclone system over water. It is powered by said water. 
Um, other tropical storms include tropical depressions and tropical storms. Um, so tropical storms are one step above a depression and one step below a hurricane. Winds will go from 61 to 119 kilometers per hour. Uh, whereas tropical depressions are very low wind speeds, they do have a twist, they don't have an eye wall, and they're below 61 kilometers per hour. Uh, they will diminish intensity as soon as they move over cooler water or over land, or if the large-scale flow aloft is unfavorable for hurricane formation, so it will die out. Um, they all start as depressions, and they pick up and evolve. So they get stronger. The longer they are out at sea in the warmer tropical waters, the stronger they will become. Once they hit land, they will slow down. If it goes up into the Atlantic Ocean, northern Atlantic, the water is cooler, it will slow down. It's very rare that up north we get hit with anything very strong. So when we do get hit, it's pretty devastating. Um, storm surges. This is where hurricane damage comes in. Storm surges is essentially, um, if you want to think about it this way, hurricanes are like water spouts. They suck up water like no tomorrow, and then they have to deposit it somewhere. So they deposit it on land. So you get this large dome of water that's like 65 to 80 kilometers wide. It sweeps across the coast where the eye makes landfall because the hurricane sucks it up as it moves. And then you also have wind damage and inland flooding from torrential rain, lots of rain. So things to think about here, where is the eye wall? Where is the eye? Where do you think the most dangerous spots would be along where it is making landfall? Um, and then based on this, based on this, do you think the cyclone will strengthen or weaken based on its path? So if it starts here, okay, tropical storm down here, when it gets up here, do you think it will be a hurricane? Will it have strengthened into a full hurricane at this point? What do you think? All right, that's our lecture. Don't forget to post your questions in the discussion board. All right, have a great day.